The year is 202 BC, and Publius Cornelius Scipio has deployed the Roman Manifold in a rather unusual fashion. Scipio is careful in choosing this battle formation, knowing that he faces the great Hannibal Barca here at Zama. Zama was one of history's most significant battles. It pitted two of the ancient world's greatest commanders against each other, fielding more than 30,000 troops on either side. It was the climax of a century-long struggle between two empires for control of the Western Mediterranean. The Roman legion was generally deployed in a checkerboard order on three rows of combat divided in the middle. The front row was formed by the hostati units, separated by a space equal to that occupied by a single manipul. The gaps were covered by maniples of principally, which occupied the second row. The last row was formed by triari covering the ranges left empty by the manipula of principally. But instead of alternating maniples in checkerboard formation, Scipio disposed the manipula and column as to create lanes to let pass the predictable elephant attack. Therefore, at the forefront he deployed the hostat, with villages covering the lanes and acting as bait. They had orders to move, once the elephants were almost in contact with the infantry, leaving the lanes open and allowing the elephants to go through them. The Roman cavalry of Caolelia was on the left, while on the right was the Numidian Massinus's cavalry. Moreover, among the front rows Scipio disposed several men with trumpets and percussion instruments which had the task of making noise as to scare the elephant. lined up his army on three lines, keeping in mind the quality of his troops. He deployed the newly recruited elephant contingents at the front with the motive of putting the first lines of the Roman infantry in disarray. At the forefront of his infantry, Hannibal deployed the various groups of mercenaries, Italic allies, Gauls and Ligurians. Hannibal knew that these units should not be able to withstand a full frontal Roman assault, and it was vital that the elephants disrupted the Roman lines before the Carthaginian vanguards engaged. Hannibal deployed the hastily recruited African contingents from Carthage at the second row, at a short distance from the first. Even these units weren't reliable as they were without adequate training and experience and were to confront the Romans only after the intervention of elephants and mercenaries. In the third row, far beyond the first two lines, at about 178 meters, Hannibal had deployed his veterans of Italian campaign, ready to intervene, even with more complex tactics, perhaps to strike the decisive blow. These veterans were of a rich ethnic mix, though virtually all his men are likely to have been heavily armed, often wearing captured Roman kit. They take to the field, but those fools would do better preparing their own funeral pyres. We have the advantage, we have pressed forwards, and I would have not done so if victory would not be ours. Make ready, men. Hannibal had deployed some 2,000 cavalry on either sides of his infantry line. However, Hannibal did not expect much from them, and their task was just to neutralize and block the Roman cavalry, superior in numbers and training. Therefore, a differentiated deployment of appropriately trained troops, elephants, and mercenaries will form the first two strikes in succession. The African troops will provide support, 
and a veteran reserve had to confront the Roman when they had been eventually warned. The battle, as Scipio predicted, was opened by the attack of the Carthaginian war elements. The barely trained elephant contingents were frightened by the sounds coming from the ranks of Rome, were partly driven back towards the Carthaginian left flank. In an attempt to capitalize on the current events on the battlefield, the Numidian cavalry on the Roman right flank under Caelelio and Massinus advanced to further harass the elephants and disrupt the Carthaginian left. wreaked havoc in the cavalry unit. Some of the Carthaginian cap charged at the Numidians. The rest were shattered. The contingent of the elephants was now in no shape of returning to battle against the Romans. The Numidians overwhelmed the Carthaginians in melee and started chasing the fleeing Carthaginian cavalry, giving them no chance to recruit nor return to the battle. The infantry, however, slowly advanced towards the attacking Romans. The other elephants had more success reaching the Roman lines. The Carthaginian lines slowed down as they wanted to witness the plight of their enemy from a safe distance as their unleashed beasts trembled and stampeded among the Roman lines. The Romans prepared to deal with the elephants as instructed by their general. Lanes started opening up as the villages withdrew to the rear on the arrival of the elephants. The elephants were thereby channeled into the spaces left between the manipulators. The elephants passed without causing much damages to Hostot, Principles, and Triarch. Spectacular volleys of javelins and pila were projected towards the elephants. The elephants have fallen into Scipio's trap. The magnificent beasts fell one by one as they disparately tried to disturb the Roman lines. Only the villages paid a hefty price. It was Scipio's ingenuity and the loyalty of the villages that saved the army for this time. The Carthaginians could not believe that the elephants were almost gone. However, they did not have any time to waste as the Hastati had formed into a single row and slowly marched towards the Carthaginians. on the left prepared to charge at the Carthaginian right wing. The Carthaginian cav countercharged and held the Roman equities. Fierce melee broke between the two parties. All thought the Carthaginian cav held their ground initially. They were overwhelmed by the Roman forces and were almost enveloped.
The Carthaginian calf tried to disengage and fall back and the Romans kept chasing at their tail. So far everything has gone in Scipio's favor. The elephants and both wings of Hannibal's cavalry had been defeated, and the victorious cavalry had followed the enemy horses off the battlefield, clearing the ground for an exclusive struggle of infantry. Scipio's infantry now advanced, mobilizing from the column formation to continuous line, and prepared to greet the Carthaginian front line with the cold sharp gladius and sturdy skew. The Hastati now closed with Hannibal's first line of infantry, mainly Gauls and Ligurians. After an exchange of Pila from both sides, the Hastati led a glorious charge against their charging opponents. Thousands of Roman scutums clashed with the barbarian shield, and fear swords and spears started quenching their bloodthirst. The Roman infantry were superior to the Gallic host in close quarters fight. Roman soldiers were trained to fight as a unit, with locked shields and stabbing blows of the sword. The Gauls were individualists, who deployed long slashing swords, the use of which tended to expose the body to counter thrust. This subtle distinction, magnified a thousand times along the fighting front, helped tip the balance. The Principes were in close support of the Hastati and were of course fellow countrymen. Also, the Principes supported the Hastati whenever a gap was seen in the line. The confidence of the Hastati was boosted and they kept pushing the Carthaginian mercenaries. Fierce melee broke out and gaps started appearing in the Carthaginian front. However, Hannibal's Africans of the second line in contrast hung back, perhaps under orders not to become untangled or perhaps lacking the experience and resolve, leaving the Gauls and Ligurians feeling isolated. The Gauls and Ligurians started giving ground, but fell back towards the second line, but they found their escape blocked by the phalanx formed by the African recruits. The inexperienced troops at the second line feared that if they broke formation and let the Gauls and Ligurians through, they would probably now be able to reform against the charging Hostad in time. They rather watched their Gallic and Ligurian allies get massacred. Some of the troops were however able to escape the fray and join the second and third line. The Hostadi by then got overconfident at their success and kept advancing towards the fleeing Gauls and Ligurians. Out of formation, the Hastati led chaotic charges against the Carthaginian phalanx on the second line. The impetus of their charge struck the inexperienced African recruits with terror. However, the phalanx held and the fresh African recruits, although nervous, started thrusting the exhausted but excited Hastati with their sharp spear and deflected the gladius with their sturdy shields. However, in their pursuit of glory, the Hastati broke their formations and had started taking casualties. Hastati were now tired and shaken, and had taken heavy losses, having fought both elephants and gauls. Facing a fresh line, they faltered and had to be reinforced by detachments of Principles who were now fed forwards into the fight. The Principles in reserve formed up and slowly advanced to the rear of the Hastati and signaled the Hastati to fall back. The principally cautiously charged the Carthaginian phalanx and replaced the fighting Hastati. The Hastati then L tactically retreated from the front line and were stationed as reserves. The principally were a brute fighting force of the Roman war machine. These were trained experienced and battle-hardened men from Scipio's Hispanic campaigns. The African recruits were barely any match for them. The Carthaginian phalanx now faltered, and the troops sustained considerable casualties.
probably witnessing this, Hannibal singled the fighting Carthaginians to fall back towards the veteran reserves. As the Carthaginian phalanx retreated, Scipio saw this as an opportunity to reorganize his troops. The Principes were signaled not to pursue their retreating foe, rather fall back a few paces and reform with the tree army. The 200-yard gap between Hannibal's second and third lines, and the great mass of dead, wounded, gore, and abandoned kit littering the field imposed a pause. Scipio used this opportunity to reorganize his line. The hostati and the reserves were depleted, the principles in considerable disorder. Only the triari remained in hand as a fresh, well-ordered reserve. Confronting a phalanx of 20,000 battle-hardened veterans, it was essential for the Roman commander to reform his ranks. Scipio knew that it would take more than just the triari to match Hannibal's veterans. The hostati were recalled and routed. The principles were regrouped and redeployed on either flank and the tree Ari now joined the front line, taking station on the two outer wings, where they might stabilize the weakened maniples of the center. Overlapping the enemy line, act as the two arms of a pincer to close around the opposing flanks. Scipio was in no hurry now. Not only was it important for him to steady and reorder his line, but he was awaiting the return of his cavalry. His plan was for the tree Ari to fix the front of Hannibal's veterans, while his bloodied ranks of hostati and principles pressed against their flanks. The reformed Roman Aeneas slowly advanced towards the Carthaginian line of veterans. Recalling the fates of their fellow Romans at Cannae and Trivia, the Romans took caution yet were anxious for revenge. The amount of bad blood that the Romans and Carthaginians shared was reflected through the bloody melee that ensued after the charge. The fight continued, neither side gaining a foot. Roman and Carthaginian blood stained the battlefield. No matter how hard the Romans tried, they could not break the veteran formations. The battle-hardened veterans of Hannibal Barca proved their worth. However, Scipio now fears that if he did not receive any reinforcements, the Romans faced inevitable doom. It was now a curious battle on this room. We do not know how long the struggle lasted, but the two lines of heavy infantry, perhaps 40,000 men in all, collided, grappled, and stabbed and hacked at close quarters for a time, adding more to the heaps of dead and dying. Things had started getting pretty desperate for the Roman general. He expected the Italian and Numidian calf to have returned by now. However, their delay indicated either their defeat at the hands of the Carthaginians or even worse, the betrayal of the Numidians. To make the matter worse, there appeared a huge cavalry force still houted at the horizon. No one could tell if they were the Romans or the Carthaginians. As they got closer, Scipio's resolve got stronger at the sight of victorious Roman cavalry. However, at the sight of the Roman calf to the rear, Hannibal lost all hope of turning this battle around. He was advised to withdraw from battle, along with as many troops he could save. The rest that failed to escape with the Carthaginian general were surrounded by the Romans. Massinus and Laelius returned at the head of their men and closed off the Carthaginian rear. And that meant it was all over bar the killing, the battle, the war, the empire. Around 20,000 were slain on the Carthaginian side, 2,000 or so on the Roman. Hannibal himself.
himself escaped among the half or more of the Carthaginian army that got away. But he immediately devoted himself to securing peace, insisting that the defeat was absolute, that further resistance was hopeless, that his people should take whatever terms they could. A Roman military system based on a mass citizen militia eventually proved its superiority over a Carthaginian military system based on mercenary service. The former had a strategic and logistical depth lacking in the latter, and this was finally decisive. Publius Cornelius Scipio, Scipio Africanus, brought this military system to a peak of proficiency. He was not necessarily Hannibal's superior as a great commander any more than Wellington was Napoleon. Grant was Lee's, or Montgomery was Rommel's. But he was perhaps the first truly great captain to command Roman legions, the first to demonstrate their world conquering potential. Thank you so much for watching, and do press the like button, as it would help this channel grow. Feel free to subscribe if you are interested in history and historical battles.